Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Our guest today is Hugh Hendry, the notorious macro hedge fund manager who's now giving out macro bits, laying down understanding of the landscape. Hugh, welcome to Wall Street Silver. Well, um, I'm not welcoming you, welcoming you to my bedroom, um, <laughs> it's, but it is a bedroom. And I think I'm breaking all the rules already of social media. It's like, yeah. never, never demonstrate a bed. This is, that's a really beautiful Ralph Lauren bed in St. Bars. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, um, you know, I, I've been watching you for years on uh, various, uh, you know, we, when you do your interviews on Real Vision, on other on other interviews you've done, and it's just a pleasure to meet you for the first time and have you on our, our, our channel. Uh, we really appreciate it. Do you watch me like this, like everyone else? Like, <laughs> no. But, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, because you know the way traffic slows down when there's a car crash on the other side? Yeah. And you're like, what's happening there? And then it interrupts the flow and the circulation and you create a traffic jam. I'm the accident on the other side. Yeah, but no, but you, you do have a very different perspective, a very original perspective that we don't hear from a lot of other people. And, uh, you know, we appreciate that. And that's why we're so thrilled that you agreed to come on our channel. We appreciate that. Um, Thank you. you know, Ivan, I'll, I'll let you I'll let you kick it off, Ivan. Yeah, Hugh, you see firms uh, like Apple, Amazon, Twitter, they're basically cutting their workforce. And now you see Meta this week, they cut 11,000 jobs. Will all these layoffs uh, cause the Fed to change direction? What's your thoughts? Ultimately, yes. I mean, the, the Fed is set on, I mean, the principal mission of the Fed is demand destruction. And unfortunately, they are, uh, they've done this before. They've got bad form. You know, my my complaint, my fear, but the thing, the force that unsettles me is that we have not recovered from the 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 bankruptcy of the global financial system in 2008. Now, yes, nominal GDP is higher, but we've never reattained the growth rate, the march of prosperity. We had like 40, 50 years where Western you know, mature economies, we're kind of clipping at two and a half, like between two and a half, 2.8%. We're not there anymore. We're like one and a half percent. And cumulatively, that grows every, every year that you fail, you fail to hit that level. Um, cumulatively, you're talking about trillions and tr like $18 trillion of lost prosperity, which is making people angry. Now, why are we not attaining the previous growth rate? Because the Fed keeps panicking, saying, fire, fire, there's inflation and hiking rates. You know, the first instance was, what, 2013, where we had the taper tantrum. So they just said, we think, you know, they could, oh, my God, the economy is getting better. That's that's a good thing. Hit the brake. Why? So we, we hit the brake in 13 and 15 and 18, and now we're doing the same. So, yeah, uh, there, there will be consequences. People are losing their jobs people are losing you know incremental prosperity thank you federal reserve you know is that a function of uh just too much debt being piled in the system and that reduces our potential to grow at this point or is it a lack of cheap cheap high quality energy in the system with what's going on in the world with oil with russia and ukraine um what, you know, what's the cause of why growth is not achieving those expectations? Um, I th what is the I So let's go through it. A debt? This is a contentious thing to say. Um, but you can deal with debt, and then you can deal with a lot of debt if you can control the carry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were controlling the carry in terms of the, the payment, the servicing. You know, if you've got zero interest rates, who cares? Yeah, right. um, but if you start, you know, I've seen your tweets and stuff, and we're looking at seven and a half percent thirty-year mortgages. That becomes an issue, <laughs> and when you start seeing Volcker, well, you know, um, the Volcker presidency uh, was fifty years ago, and it was um, at the end of a forty-year process of deleveraging the economy. The, the the debt is so many times greater. So when you had very little debt, you could raise interest rates. I like to just in simple terms, if we say total debt, Fed, uh, Treasury, plus households, plus corporate, plus whatever's in the banking sector. Back then, maybe 1x the economy. Today, let's call it, let's approximate it to 4x. Wow. So with, with one times debt to GDP, the Fed went terminal, went to 20. 
And with four X GDP, the terminal expectation today is five, four times five, 20. That's kind of where we are. But in obviously being at 20 and, it, and, it, and being in a, in a deep recession, um, they cause a lot of harm. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, like the job losses, that's, that's what happens. So, and, and energy, I mean, the US is just looking so damn super, super sexy on energy. I mean, like you have like inf- almost infinite amounts of natural gas. We just kind of got to reprocess some of the, the thinking in terms of let's move this thing, let's use this thing. You know, mm-hmm. so US looks like a the you know, superstar on, on on energy, but mostly I think um, the financial sector, the private financial sector, which ultimately is responsible for the creation of credit, has lost its module. Um, having had a near death experience, it's like well, I don't really want to lend to you, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. If the banks are not extending that credit with the same rhythm, with the same ferocity as previously, then I think that that's the answer that lies behind your question. Now, where, paradoxically, they're very willing to lend against asset prices, but that exists, that's like non-sovereign money. So Mm -hmm. what is non-sovereign money? We're coming into the realm of the the mysterious uh, Euro-dollar market, which is overseas, and I fear the Fed doesn't see that. The Fed looks this way. The Fed is a, a domestic regulator of domestic banking. But mm-hmm. in terms of the credit flowing through the U.S. system, the, oversee- the overseas creation of dollars is multiples the creation of dollars onshore. So all of that, if you will, ignorance, so, if you will. You know, I've heard you say that you think the Fed is paving a path of destruction. Um, now, would you say it's intentional or just through incompetence? I mean, what's what's paving this path of destruction that you see out there? Well, well it is very much to the point I'm trying, I'm, I'm poorly describing. So I think of money in three forms. Number one form would be um, a hybrid of the government and the private sector. And this is, uh, this is your bank deposits onshore. Mm-hmm. It's regulated by the Federal Reserve. It's insured by the Treasury. First form of money. Second form of money would be um, the advent of quantitative easing and the creation of uh, banking reserves. Okay? And I would call that pure, pure government money, if you will. Okay. And the third form is pure private money, which is the creation of dollar bills out with the sovereignty and, and the, the territory of the United States. Um, and what I'm saying is that with financial innovation, the size of uh, the forms of money two and three have grown much greater. And principally the third form, this uh, pure, super stoked, private creation of, of money. And the mm-hmm. Fed, I fear, is either disinterested or unable to compre- comprehend what's happening. Now that third form, this euro dollar, that's creating a lot, past tense, it created a lot of inflation. Again, inflation, let's keep saying it. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Maybe the Fed will hear us. Fed is a monetary phenomenon. So, But that inflation is in asset prices. Yeah, um, But it's not in channeling and funneling money um, to U.S. households and U.S. corporations. So I've heard you also say the Fed is in a fog. Um on U.S. Fed, Fed fog, Fed fog, Fed, Fed fog. There's a Fed <laughs> fog, and that U.S. Treasuries are in a killing zone, and I found that kind of interesting. What do you mean when you say U.S. Treasuries are in a killing zone? Um, I'm so part of my thing, my meta is uh, con- forming contentious narrative, mm-hmm. uh, risking my reputation on my on my deduction. Uh, with the hope of salvation being that it becomes the accepted belief system. And, and I try and um, ensure against you know, the conceit and the arrogance of just good thinking by ensuring that when I take such a risk, I'm on trend. You know, I mm-hmm. never, I ne- I, you can be contentious and recommend, it was contentious recommending the ownership of treasuries in 2005, 2006, 
Mm -hmm. uh, people thought the economy was overheating. We were going to have inflation. And I could just see that, again, Fed fog would, would just would blow up <laughs> the economy. So, uh, But I was on trend. trend tre treasuries were tr price trending higher. So with regard to the killing zone, I'm very, I'm acutely vulnerable in my risk taking just now because treasuries are just hanging on. They're, they've been ice climbing and the crampons and the ice axes are scraping now <laughs> down the ice. Treasuries have to hold here in terms of very, very long term 40, 50 year charts. And they've just about done it over the last six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, slippage, they will be slipping into the dustbin of history. I, I would then walk away and say, you know what, you're right. This, uh, this is the oh, this, this, this is the, the end of the, the, the profound treasury bull market. I would be amazed if it's the end because I think I'd, I'd love to discuss with you later how I believe profound changes in bull markets are characterized by absurdity. So you've also said inflation's not really understood by most people, that, that we all are not really getting what inflation means mm -hmm. and, and how it's interpreted. What did you mean by that? Yeah, okay, so two things, and we might have to pivot from the Fed fog. Um, I'm very conscious that we put it all on the Fed, and, and that that's very unfair. There's, there's another huge uh, agent of, uh, of change that's, that's clouding the matter. And that's the, uh, the form of mercantilism that's coming out of Asia, coming out of everywhere, mercantilists, you know. Uh, but you know, China is China's not a free society. Um, China, let's use the technical term, is transferring wealth from its household sector. It sounds kind of benign. You know, <laughs> in another world, you could say they're stealing from the household sector. He's stealing it! Um, <laughs> And they're enriching the central state to ensure continuity and power. And um, they're trying to take the oscillations that we associate with um, economies, the cycles of boom and bust, that they worry about their longevity. This is the Chinese Communist Party. So they, they, so far they've achieved a, a system that, that doesn't oscillate. It's just a linear progression of, of GDP. I would say GDP without wealth, they sacrifice wealth to get there. However, to, to remove the oscillation and the downside, mm -hmm. they take the money that they've transferred. We're talking trillions upon trillions of US dollars equivalent, um, and they park it into the, the, treasury, uh, the treasury bill market. So effectively, uh, their currency should be rising. It should be appreciating. So if we go back, 30 years ago to the NAFTA agreement, 1994, mm -hmm. um, their currency was nine. You, you required nine pieces of red cabbage to buy a US dollar, nine one to buy a dollar. Today, that figure is 7.3. That's like, it's only appreciated 20% the last 30 years. Really, mm -hmm. guys? Only 20%? <laughs> you, should, you should require four renminbi to buy a dollar. Instead, you require 7.3. And if you look at the charts, like we all do, it's sliding. This is its worst year-to-date performance. Um, and it, you know, again, charts suggest that you could go to nine, so you could go back to where it traded 30 years ago. That's what they do, if you will, to buttress themselves, to make themselves rock solid against um, the forces of cyclicality. But that five, four, five trillion dollars that they have cumulatively dropped into uh, the treasury market has destroyed the intelligence of money. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how can we expect the Fed to make good decisions when money's become dumb, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I retired from macro hedge fund manager in 17. As my clients know, really, I retired at the end of 2013. I said, you don't need me. This is dumb money and it's going up, right? Um, but, but money and the price of money, in a market-based account, a uh, market-based system like ours, it it brings debtors and creditors together. Debtors, us, the people with the ideas, the people can change the world. <laughs> you know, we we got we're overflowing with ideas. We got a deficit of money, and then you've got the creditors, right? China, Saudi Arabia, you know, Apple, right? Apple can't spend its money. You know, it can't spend its money, 
And the price, so the, there's a price of engagement where the creditors go, hey, you know, take my money, right? And that system has been broken by this avalanche of this aggressive trade policy out of China. It, it's affecting all of us. It, it makes anyone, so Wall Street's like, hey, we love the communists, you know? Mm-hmm. It just sends up the asset prices. But for everyone else, you get it in the ass. That's the, yeah. that's the, the profound tension which you see in the overnight uh, uh, mid, uh, what do you call it, mid, what are we saying, mid-term elections. Yeah. Um, you know, it will potentially, it will certainly bring Trump back onto, you know, the ticket because we haven't resolved it. What you, one of the things that you've also talked about recently is the consequences of China devaluation. Um, is that something we're starting to see? You know, what are the long term consequences if they do devalue as a, instead of letting their, their currency appreciate like you think it should? Yeah. OK. So what are the, the, the so first of all, the dollar is going up. One, one could even say surging. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not believe it's going up because the Federal Reserve is, is increasing interest rates. I think if you go back and you look and you try and perform a study, just simply as a simple study and try and work out correlations, doesn't mm-hmm. work. I think owing to profound stress and strain in this invisible euro dollar market where the people, the banks who run like a casino in bed on, they they lend for 24 hours. And so when they're feeling full of jobbing juice, which is say optimistic about things, you present to them, maybe you present to them 10 year Indian sovereign uh, treasury paper. You say, Mm -hmm. hey, here's a hundred million dollars equivalent. And they'll give you $99 million. Today, I'm picking on India. This could be the Italian 10 years uh, sovereign bonds. Um, it, you know, it could be, it, it might be a, a portfolio of what are deemed to be high quality, robust equities. Right. Heavens, back in the day, I bet you it was a kind of collateralized debt obligation on the value of property in China. But you know, we began this conversation about layoffs, right? Believe me, the, the bank participants who are landing in the, the offshore non-sovereign money market that we call euro dollars, they've seen the recession. They see it now. And they're closing shop. And then every 24 hours, they're calling money in. They're saying, I don't want your Indian bonds. I want US treasury bills. I don't want your Italian. I don't want your Chinese assets. I, I want US treasury bills. So at the margin... Uh, that market is a seller of everything and a buyer of dollars. So for China, even though it's a, a dirty peg, mm-hmm. yeah, it's pegged to the dollar. And it finds itself pegged to this damn currency, which is meant to go down, but is going up. <laughs> At the same time, as our previous conversation, the GDP calculator, calculator isn't working. You know, you put five in, you get three. So they're like, wow. So let Maybe we let the currency weaken further. We go to nine. So why is that? Why is that a consequence? A, a poor consequence. Listen, you know the, the ordinary folk. Um, prices in the U.S. A basket of goods and services in the U.S. economy year over year are ten percent. Cost you ten percent more than last year, right? Are you getting? Are you getting a ten percent pay increase? No. No. Why are you not getting a ten percent pay increase? Because they'll ship your job out to China. China's performing, this is it's called trade war, it's class warfare, right? Like the ordinary folk um, don't get the 10% pay rise. Par- paradoxically, or if we are to jump forward, that's why I don't believe this is inflation because you would have to, you'd have to, in the 70s, there was no China and the euro dollar market was actually a proactive uh, credit provider and so actually your wages were rising 10 percent 12 percent 15 percent didn't feel particularly rich but you could maintain your consumption but the ordinary folk today with this dagger of china stealing its jobs right they're not getting the pay rise which means they have difficult decisions to make discretionary spending is at the margin weaker. If you look at any discretionary equity listed on the stock market, where is it? It's in free fall. Restaurant stocks, airline stocks, right? Sure, you travel and it's kind of busy just now, but look at the share price. It's looking kind of 18 months forward. It's like, oh my mm-hmm. God, you know, oh my God. So 
That's what I see. Uh, China's an enormous influence. It has disrupted our understanding of money. It's made money dumb. Mm -hmm. um, we blame the Fed's QE. I, I think that's unfair. I think QE's laundromat tokens is latent money, but it requires uh, private sector banks to take those reserves mm -hmm. and actually turn them into credit. They haven't done that. I must tell you, the one place that's done that, you know, so the huge fear of quantitative easing is that those banking reserves get turned into credit. And if that happens, boom, hyperinflation. Yeah. The one place where that has happened is in Japan. Japan has gone into the overnight money markets and has gone, you know, like, it's almost like they're taking drugs. And like, <laughs> you know what? We've got a, I've got a billion dollars of Japanese banking reserves and a hundred billion dollars of JGB yields. I don't think like, can I exchange them for dollar bills? Mm -hmm. And like I say, 18 months ago, it was like, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Right. <laughs> and then what happens is there's a Chinese company and it needs oil. It's an exporter, but it needs oil. Right. But, you know, in its bank, it has red cabbage again, my uh, name for Remimbi. And to buy the oil, it needs dollars. OK, so it then has to, if you will, kind of the Japanese bank will lend its treasury bills as collateral. The Chinese bank will go to another bank and say, hey, look, I've got this dollar security. Will you give me a line of credit? And then it buys the oil. That's what, right? But all of that's unwinding because in that, in that overnight, it could be in New York, it could be in London, um, they're going, oh my God, I don't want JGB, JGB bills. I want dollar bills. And so they're calling it back and you're getting, it goes all the way. It goes to the, the Chinese exporter. Suddenly he gets his collateral pool. Suddenly he has to pay back his outstanding credit. Suddenly he's not, he's not employing people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see, you see the force of all that in the weakness of, of the yen. The yen ain't going down because some dope hedge fund macro superstar is shorting JGB. They're insignificant versus like what I can see in the euro dollar market. Wow. You know, have you been, um, I know you, you, you do watch gold and silver a little bit uh, as part of the big picture. Have you been surprised gold uh, and silver have not gone up more with all the chaos in the world? Uh, uh, off the hip, no. Mm -hmm. More considered, um, I have to say, before I insult everyone who likes gold, I have to say, I'm on the home team, right? My first calendar year as a hedge fund manager, I earned 50%. I'm not, I'm gloating, maybe, maybe not. I'm just saying I made 50%. It was 2003. I was, as the Bank of England was selling gold, like gold, why, why do we have gold? You know, sell it, you know. Um, I was buying it. I was buying it at nice. 300 bucks. Wow. And that was nice. That was nice. Um, so, uh, introduction over. Gold is preposterous. It's a stupid asset, right? Um, <laughs> But that makes it interesting. Like when the world becomes chaotic, mm -hmm. it's it's the ultimate expression of Dadaism. It's like the world is so crazy. I might as well buy the dumbest, most stupid asset in the world, which is gold. <laughs> I'm playing with you, but you know, not not so much. Um, and so the world is. This, this is the dawn of chaos. I mean, I, I've written that paper. This is the dawn of chaos. You know, we we had forty years of order cycles change the impermanence of life things change this is mm -hmm. the, the the opening salvos and chapters of chaos and so um looking ahead gold and silver look really interesting what's holding them back real interest rates mm -hmm. okay um real interest rates what are they you look at um you look at five-year tips and you, you you work back and you get you know and you get the real rate um, and with the Fed's intervention, hiking rates, uh, <laughs> real rates have gone from minus two to plus two. And that's a travesty. And that, 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 that's a travesty on many fronts, but that deeply impacts. What you'll find is that 
gold and silver perform very well in an environment of negative real treasury yields. What do you think will be the trigger out there that gets gold and silver moving mm-hmm. higher? What's the market waiting for, for gold and silver to launch? And that's what our audience really cares about at the end of the day. Um, so it would be more absurdity. And, and let, let's try and describe that absurdity. I, I, had, I attempted to titillate you earlier where I said that I believed that major profound changes from bull to bear market in, in asset classes like treasuries or the S&P. When gold last flared and it hit the over 800 bucks in, in January uh, 1980, there was another two years in the Fed in the deepest post-war recession. The Fed ultimately pushed rates to 20%. And if you had a pulse, yeah, and if you were kind of reasonably active, everyone knew that inflation was in abeyance. You know, there's a, there a trend and the inflation rate was collapsing, understandably, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so it was kind of absurd that in the face of declining inflation, the Fed kept raising rates. That we ended up with twenty percent, you know, sh- you know, short Fed funds rate, and you know the the ten year Treasury was sixteen percent. It that that was an absurdity. It didn't make sense against contextually against the background. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are some amazing hedge fund managers. Um, Michael Steinhoff is is one who he got sued by his investors for having the temerity to. St- to sell bonds and buy equities in 1982. Like, that's called style drift. You're an idiot. You're losing money. It's like inflation is collapsing. <laughs> Ten-year treasury is at 16%. You people are idiots, and I'm a legend. And he was right. But you know, it was a period of absurdity. Mm. And I just think the treasury bull market will come to an end. I know that. We all know that. And I, and so I'm just saying, but what if it comes to the – here we are, we think it's – is dying now in an orthodox manner, like you know, prices are rising at 10%, the Fed's got it, Fed's got your back, going to raise rates, it's going to be a recession, then mm-hmm. it's going to be less inflation. Okay. Um, I don't see that. Um, I see that um, what the Fed's doing is it's unleashing this competitive devaluation from China, this $15 trillion economy, which already weighs on the ordinary good folk in, in the United States. Um, and you know, the unintended consequences of the Fed kind of looking very narrowly at money and not seeing, like, mm-hmm. it, it's still trying to stop money supply growing in its head, whereas I can just see money contracting in the repo market. Um, and so I'm, I'm seeing, uh, I'm very fearful that we could have a very profound recession, which would be made worse by this competitive devaluation. And if all of these forces all lock and come together, um, and you know, here we are with the S&P down 20%, the S&P's down 50, clocking mm-hmm. on 60. I think treasury bond yields could be back at COVID lows. Um, now, that would be the end, to my mind, paradoxically. I'd be like, thank you so much. That is absurd. <laughs> and now I can proclaim the death of the treasury market. Everyone will be buying treasury. I'm like, no, no, no. Now, to your point, let's get silly. Let's buy gold and silver. <laughs> <laughs> because real rates will be very negative and we're right. going to have a party. Well, wow. Hugh, you know, this has been a great discussion. I want to thank you for joining us. It's been very interesting and I'd love to do it again in the next two or three months and uh, get your take as this crazy world develops uh, with our insane central bankers and yes. <laughs> and all the bullshit that they're doing in the world. Um, yeah. You have a very original take and we definitely want to talk to you again in the future. Well, thank you. It's a great privilege. And, and really, if I just made, if people just got angry listening to me and they think I suck, I've achieved something, right? That's, mm-hmm. We just want to put a pebble into the pond and make ripples. That's what I think we're trying to do collectively here. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing your pond.